reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, faith is the realization of what is hoped for, an evidence of things not seen. For by it, some of the men of old were tortured and would not accept deliverance in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others endured mockery, scourging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawed in two, put to death at sword's point. They went about in skins of sheep or goats, needy, afflicted, tormented. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered about in deserts and on mountains, in caves and in the crevices in the earth. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us while keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter of faith. For the sake of the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and has taken his seat at the right of the throne of God. Verbum Domini. Give thanks to the Lord, his love is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, those whom he has redeemed from the hand of the foe and gathered from the lands, from the east and the west, in the north and the south. They went astray in a desert wilderness, the way to an inhabited city they did not find. Hungry and thirsty, their life was wasting away with them. They cried to the Lord in their distress. From their straits, he rescued them and he led them by a direct way to reach an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and his wondrous deeds to the children of men, because he satisfied the longing soul and filled the hungry with good things. Dominus Fobiscum, Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matthäum, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly with the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed on the third day and be raised. 
He said to his disciples, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what can one give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay everyone according to his conduct. Amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Verbum Domini. Today we celebrate the North American martyrs. There were seven Jesuits who were from France and came to what they called New France. Uh, there were not the clear borders that we have between the United States and Canada. Uh, this was, there were borders to be sure, but they were borders between the land of the Iroquois and of the Huron, that those borders had existed before the Europeans arrived. And they came into a situation in which not all the Native Americans got along very well. There were, had been lots of wars amongst the various tribes uh, of people who spoke Algonquin languages and Iroquois languages, and yet still even within the language groups. They had war amongst themselves, at, not at all unlike the Europeans, the Africans, the Asians, or anybody else. This is a human situation. Sometimes there's a certain um, ideology that it was paradise here, uh, but it wasn't you know, before the Europeans came. They had some problems, there were some problems they didn't have, others they did. Again, that's a human situation. And there, there were native empires that conquered and killed their enemies, uh, like the Aztecs, and then there were uh, others who lived in peace, so it varied. The Jesuits came here uh, along with the early French explorers like Champlain. And they very much did so out of the, the purpose for the founding of the Society of Jesus. We were founded as a missionary order. And part of our institute tells us that you should be able to go anywhere, no matter what it is, in order to bring the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and to win people to know him. And that, that's why sometimes people think we were founded to fight against the Reformation. No, that's not why we were founded. We were founded to reform people within the Catholic Church. There are a lot of bishops and uh, some popes who made the spiritual exercises in order to experience reform, like St. Charles Borromeo, whereas others, you know, uh, they did go and enter into disputes, but we also were meant to go to the missions, and already in the first years, the society went around the world as it was opening up to Europeans. One of the problems, though, is that in Europe and Asia, there had been almost no contact with the Americas little bit with Scandinavians, and as a result, the diseases that they had here were not the same as the diseases that they had in Europe. 
and vice versa. There were European diseases they didn't have here. And neither community had the immunities that the others had. And that's one of the problems that occurred. So many millions of Native Americans died because of smallpox, not due to anybody trying to infect them. People didn't understand what it meant to be a carrier that didn't have a disease. If you have a disease, sure you're infected. But to be a carrier, they had no idea, none. And the same with the diseases that were here. So there was a lot of problems as far as that went. And that made it difficult for the missionaries in uh, numbers that they were blamed correctly for bringing these uh, diseases like smallpox. And that gave a lot of resistance from the uh, various tribes here. But it wasn't because they did it on purpose. They just didn't know that they were bringing it since they didn't have the infections. And so that tension plus these Jesuits were men extremely well educated in France, most of them. There were two lay brothers who, uh, actually they were laymen, who gave themselves over to the service of the missionaries. They, uh, Gabriel Lallemand and um, uh, René Goupil, they gave themselves, uh, they're called donés, gifts, to serve the Jesuits, but right before their martyrdoms, they were both received as Jesuit brothers. They died in the society. But the, the, the five priests were very well educated. Greek, Latin was normal, of course, plus French and other languages. And they come to this continent and it's different language systems. They had no preparation for even how to begin to understand the grammar of the people. No one had ever written a grammar. They learned to do that. Their mentality was that they would learn the Native American culture and language and customs and try to see, especially Saint Jean de Brebeuf. Uh, Brebeuf was very careful, he's a good linguist, and he figured out so much about the, the languages of the Huron, as well as the Algonquin system, and wrote some of the first books in those languages, the first Christmas hymn in Huron. And he would also write down grammars and dictionaries. The Jesuits all did this, and you can still read, uh, it, there's an English translation of what's called the Jesuit Relations, it's still studied by anthropologists because they were such careful observers of the culture. Their assumption was not to make the Huron French, their assumption was to bring them Jesus Christ. That's an important distinction. And that they wanted the uh, Huron to know a freedom from some of the practices that they had that were somewhat superstitious. That's, as a matter of fact, it was superstitious interpretations of why they got sick. Or when somebody arrived, it rained, therefore he must be a rainmaker. That was one of the nicknames for uh, one of the Jesuits. They used the rainmakers when he arrived, he, it rained that day. Well, he didn't cause it to rain, but it was gonna, they, they weren't there to teach science either. They were there to evangelize. And it's a good thing, you can look it up online, but Saint Jean de Brebeuf wrote a letter back to France, inviting more Jesuits to come, saying, you will have a mat for a bed, you'll live in a, t in a hut that is more miserable than any hut that you'll find in France. And when you come exhausted, you won't be able to sleep because of all the fleas. They'll keep you up all night. And the food is awful when you can find some. 
And as far as your fine education and your knowledge of Aristotle and Plato, you will end up being like a babbling infant because you can't speak anything to the local people. And in addition, their children will make fun of you because you can't speak. So we invite you to come. <laughs> and they also knew that there was a high likelihood that they might also suffer martyrdom. They're well, in fact, they took vows that they would not turn away from martyrdom. And martyrdom was nasty. These are among the most tortured martyrs in the history of the church. And the, uh, it was part of ritual. When you captured your enemy, they would ritually torture you and then kill you. And, in the, and because the Jesuits were known, and it's marked by some of the survivors, that they did not flinch in the face of the torture, the Iroquois who killed them cut out their hearts immediately and ate them raw. So they said, I want that kind of courage too. Now what the Jesuits wanted is for them to have that faith because it's not raw courage of the human level. It is a love of Jesus Christ that sustains them to go through the torture, not for the sake of showing how tough they are, but rather for the sake of being faithful to the one who sent them to proclaim this good news of God's salvation and to bring people away from things like torturing others. That's, that's an evil. That was one of the evils that they wanted to fight against. And it's one that, again, is not limited to Native Americans. Those of us who know the history of the 20th century are well aware of the spread of torture and evil. And uh, as a result, it was very important to, to work to undo it. And I think for us to consider not only this history, and, and it's well worth going to the Shrine of the North American Martyrs in Canada, where four of the Jesuits had been martyred, as well as in upstate New York, where three of them had been martyred, Isaac Jogues and uh, René Goupil and Gabriel Lallemand, that they, uh, it's good to go to those places and consider some of the ways that they approached the Native Americans as we approach our fellow Americans today. Many people keep on commenting about the ways in which our culture has become increasingly coarse, increasingly angry. There is a, a, a lot of name calling there's a lot of uh, rejection of anybody who disagrees with me is a hater. That, by the way, just so you know, that's not just because people are emotionally upset. That is ideology. There are certain communist authors who wrote that you should call anybody who disagrees with you a hater. This is in, uh, th th there was an Italian communist and some others who put that as part of the ideology in order to amp up the anger. And we see that being taught, taught to call others haters. And yet, as we look at this going on in our culture, our task is not to click our teeth and wag our tongues and say, oh, this is sad. Uh, it's not like the old days. Well, it's not, but that's another problem. Our task is to realize this is just as much our mission field as were the Huron and the Iroquois. That just as they were mission field for these Jesuits in the 1640s, so also these 
people that we see yelling and screaming and destroying property, I still never understand why they destroy Starbucks. I thought that's where they went to hang out. But be that as it may, they go and destroy all these buildings. We see that over and over again in the news. And we have to realize this is our mission. And part of what we need to do is try and understand the language they're using. We see this incredible miscommunication going on over the national anthem at football games. There are two different conversations going on, and there's not a good communication at all. The, the behavior is misunderstood and uh, on both sides, and there's incomprehension. Part of our task as Catholics is to learn the language, not only of uh, native peoples of hundreds of years ago, but of the Americans of today, so that we can be a bridge that goes to the society, not to sway politics and parties, but to call one another to a recognition of the inherent dignity that is given by God to a lot of people who don't like God, to a lot of people who actually hate God and hate Christianity and blame us for all the problems, not unlike the way that the local folks blamed the inadvertent bringing of uh, the diseases of Europe to people who were not willfully doing that, but you know, mis didn't know what was going on. So also, we have to be people that bridge that communication in such a way that we also, at the same time, don't just walk away saying, oh, it's nice that we understand each other. No, beyond that, beyond that, the goal is to bring Jesus Christ to our society. And as we can see, sometimes people, uh, especially the, the left, is stalking people they disagree with and doing things on uh, Twitter and all that to, to report on them and cause antagonism. And we might get as much antagonism from some of them as St. Isaac did from the Iroquois. Okay, so what? It's still our task to address the situation that we have with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with a call away from sin of all kinds, as well as a call towards virtue, towards holiness, a holiness that is defined by Jesus Christ himself, and a holiness that he grants as a gift of his grace so that we invite them to come receive Jesus Christ and know him. Often it means that we have to first learn to sit quietly with them before the blessed sacrament, before the Lord, and then be able to address to them in a peace that he gives them the truth about his gospel. This is a great task. And it is time for us in the church to make sure that we take up that mission with the kind of faith that we see in Hebrews. It's the faith being the realization of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen. This is the task of faith in our world today.